Hi, I'm Mark Lazenby, professor of nursing at the Yukon School of Nursing. And I'm here to talk with you about inclusion and exclusion criteria for a review of the literature paper. Wait, you ask, why do I need inclusion and exclusion criteria for a literature review? Um, I'm not conducting a study, you say. I'm just writing a paper. Actually, you are conducting a study of sorts when you're writing a review paper on a clinical or a policy problem. In this paper, you're telling us what the literature has to say about this problem. So you have to approach your paper as you would approach a study with the same sort of rigor. Let me give you a real world example, and it's from my world. So say you're a cancer nurse who has encountered a problem on your unit. Say you've noticed that a psychological intervention commonly given to cancer patients, a type of cognitive behavioral therapy that's aimed to help them with depression, anxiety, and spiritual well-being, does not seem to work for a patient population you frequently work for, uh, work, care for, namely Muslims. You've noticed that Muslim, Muslim patients go to one session and then they drop out. They never go back. You really had hoped they'd go for more sessions because you've seen that they're depressed and anxious and that they're suffering and you've seen it work for other patient populations. This is a real clinical problem. Why aren't they going back? What type of psychosocial spiritual intervention works for them? You want to find out. So you set off to do a literature review. This literature review is a study. It's a study you're undertaking to find out what the evidence is, even if there is any evidence, on the type of psychotherapeutic interventions that reduce depression and anxiety and improve spiritual well-being and quality of life in Muslims undergoing treatment for cancer. That's my study. It's an actual, real study. I'm doing it with Dr. Abdallah Abu Hait. Um, we're conducting an integrative literature review on that very question. So, um, why is this literature review a scientific study? Why does its methodology, such as inclusion and exclusion criteria, have to be so important in our work? The answer has to do with the nature of science itself. Scientific studies and literature reviews need to be replicable. That is, somebody somewhere else in a different part of the country or a different part of the world should be able to take your paper in which you describe how you conducted your review, follow your description of how you conducted it, that is, follow the methods as if they were following a recipe and come up with nearly the same results that you did. What results, you ask? Well, the articles you have found in your search and the ones you've included in your review. These are the results of your review. And that's why we have to talk about inclusion and exclusion criteria. Which articles are you going to include in your review? And which articles are you going to exclude? We can't get quite to those criteria yet. We have to talk about the different types of reviews because inclusion and exclusion criteria can differ by the different types. For sake of argument, let's say there are two major reviews. One type is a systematic review, and for our purposes right now, the other type is 
everything else, or like a narrative review. I split these up because a systematic review tests a hypothesis, and the other reviews do not. Let me give you an example of a hypothesis in a systematic review. Say you're a chemotherapy nurse, and you give chemotherapy to patients with colorectal cancer. The most common chemo is 5-fluorouracil, and it causes really horrible oral mucositis. In your cancer center, you use a 2% lidocaine rinse for the management of oral mucositis pain in cancer patients undergoing 5-fluorouracil chemotherapy. Is it the best treatment? You've heard of other treatments, but you don't know what the evidence is for any of them. Your research question would be whether the evidence supports 2% lidocaine rinse solution as first-line treatment for the management of oral mucositis pain. Your hypo hypothesis would be that it is, and your review would be to see about whether or not your hypothesis holds or whether it's it disproven by another treatment that has more evidence that supports it. So at the end of your review, you could actually disprove your hypothesis or prove that it's true. Now, all other types of reviews, such as a narrative review, which you're going to do, do not test a hypothesis. There are many other types of reviews I want to be uh, clear, not just another narrative review. There's integrative review, there's a documentary review. A student of mine did a documentary review, and it was really to document what the evidence is, not to test a hypothesis, not to appraise it in any form. Um, but that's not what you're necessarily going to do. On the other hand, an integrative review summarizes empirical studies and theoretical literature, like policy statements, to provide a more comprehensive understanding of a particular phenomenon, or a clinical problem, or even a policy issue. An integrative review is not technically a systematic review because it reviews more than just empirical studies, as I just said, and it does not test a hypothesis. But it follows nearly the same methodology. It's highly rigorous, just like a systematic review, but more about that methodology later. A narrative review, like the one you're going to write, is more a summary of relevant literature. It's generally descriptive, giving, for example, background knowledge. It narrates, as it were, the contours of the clinical or policy problem. It's a good place to start before you into, go into a more complex, integrative, or systematic review. But before we go on, let me contrast these methodologies in a table. So pause the video here and look at this table with a little more time and look and, and take note of the differences between these different types of reviews and their methodologies. So now that you've looked at that table in a kind of overview fashion and seen the differences in the methods for a systematic and an integrative and a narrative review, let's zero in more on exclusion and inclusion criteria. The first thing to think about when including articles in your sample of articles to include in your review is the type of studies articles report on. A systematic review, which tests a hypothesis on treatments for oral mucositis pain, say, would only include those articles that report on randomized controlled trials of different treatments for oral mucositis. 
It would thus exclude articles that report on any other kinds of studies, such as observational studies or case reports on, say, one patient. However, an integrative review on psychotherapeutic interventions for Muslims undergoing treatment for cancer might include articles that include more types of studies than just randomized control trials. After all, there may not be enough randomized control trials of different psychotherapeutic interventions conducted in this population for a systematic review. Let me give you a real-world example. As I said, Dr. Abu Khait and I are conducting such an integrative review, which generally takes about a year to do. It's registered on Prospero. Prospero is the premier site for registering systematic and integrative reviews. And if you're reading a review and it's not been registered, say on Prospero or other sites, but Prospero is the premier one, then you should be a little suspect of the review. Why should these re systematic and integrated reviews be registered? Um, it's registered before the authors begin the work to provide an added check on the rigor and transparency of the review's methodology. Here's the Prospero's website. You can click on that link and follow it. And here is a link actually to Dr. Abu Hates and my review. Take a look at our search strategy, which was developed in consultation with the Yukon Medical Librarian. Now, take some time to look over our inclusion and exclusion criteria. What articles do we include in our review? To answer the question, let's review our re research question. The research question is, what do the included studies reveal about the outcomes of psychotherapeutic interventions in relation to symptoms of depression and anxiety, spiritual well-being, and quality of life in Muslims undergoing treatment for cancer? Coming straight out of that question are our inclusion criteria, articles that report on studies of psychotherapeutic interventions as the primary intervention in psychosocial spiritual cancer care for Muslims. And so these articles have to report on outcomes like depression, anxiety, spiritual well-being in Muslim patients who have a diagnosis of cancer. Notice that we did not stipulate that studies have to report only on randomized controlled trials. For instance, the study could be a one-arm trial, not two-arm, which randomized controlled trials have to be. They have to compare the intervention with something like a placebo. They could be um, a two-arm study, but that compares two different types of psychotherapies, which we have some in our um, integrated review. So um, now that you've seen our inclusion criteria, um, there are several aspects to it that are important. The population has to be about Muslims undergoing treatment for cancer. Two, the intervention has to be a psychotherapeutic intervention. And three, the types of studies these um, articles report on. There are three more inclusion criteria. We wanted the articles to be published within the last 10 years. We didn't want really old data. Some reviews limit it to five years. Um, uh, look back. Two, these articles had to be published in peer-reviewed journals only. We wanted articles that were rigorous, right? Um, and three, they had to be published in English. While Dr. Abu Khait and I can read Arabic, we can't, for instance, read Persian or Malay or Bengali or Hindi, languages in which articles may be published um, in that report on psychotherapeutic interventions in this population. After all, most Muslims live in the subcontinent 
um, and in Indonesia and Malaysia, etc., than live on the Arab Peninsula. So um, we decided to rule out bias of studies that were conducted only in the Arab Peninsula that we would we would include only those studies that were reported in English. What articles did we exclude? We excluded articles that were case reports, like on a one-off situation, or observational studies, just plain looking at what how people do. We actually wanted an intervention of some sort. Two, we excluded articles in which the psychotherapeutic intervention was not well described, and that's a judgment we had to make. And three, we excluded articles that reported on studies that included psychopharmacologic agents. Well, it would be hard to decide which was the effective intervention, the psychopharmacologic agent or the psychotherapeutic intervention. So we tossed those studies as well. So here you see an example of inclusion and exclusion criteria for an integrative review. You'll make some important, I want to make some important points about them right here. One, they come straight out of our research question. So your research question is very important because it will determine your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Two, the articles we excluded report on studies that would not help us answer our research question or that would introduce bias into our findings. Now, let me end with one more example. It's of a narrative review, though more extensive than the one you'll be writing. It's by a former student of mine, Emily Stagg, and its title is Best Practices for the Non-Pharmacologic Treatment of Depression at the End of Life. It's published in 2012 in the American Journal of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, issue 29, and it begins on page 183. You'll see that the research question was, what does the literature say about the effectiveness of non-pharmacologic treatments for depression in the end-of-life population? So you can see already it's a narrative review. What does the literature say? All right. and it's going to be a description of the clinical problem and what the literature says is the best treatment for um, non-pharmacological treatment for people at the end of life for depression. Um, you can see in the method section of the, the search strategy here, the inclusion criteria are articles that reported on randomized control trials, observational studies, or case reports. So Emily thought it was important to include all of those different types of studies because it was really a narrative review. As long as they documented a given treatment effect on a patient's mood. We also included review articles or meta-analyses that included additional analyses about the effect of non-pharmacologic treatments on people's mood who are at the end of life, people who are at the end of life on, on their mood. Um, non-pharmacologic treatments, psychotherapy, music therapy, art therapy, aromatherapy, you can read the paper and see the different types of treatments that she found. But we excluded studies that did not assess non-pharmacological treatments or evaluate mood. And that was the big one. They had to talk about depression. Notice there was not a lot of literature on the subject. And so we did not um, exclude papers based on the year of publication. We had to take all comers. Although I would write these methods a little clearer now, some nine years later, after I've learned more about how to be really copious um, in writing everything down in a method section such that someone else could replicate it, this is a good example of a narrative review that might help you to think about how to construct inclusion and exclusion criteria for the papers you're going to include in your study 
to help you answer your clinical or policy problem.